So Amethyst Steel is definitely an ink pairing that a lot of people are looking at for running in their store set championships, and rightfully so, as it's two of the strongest inks in the game. However, combined together, I don't know if you'd really consider this a top top tier option, but it definitely has meta contending uh, deck types within this ink combination that you could be using. So in this particular video, we're running an aggro oriented version that is a little bit lower to the ground. We're not running things like big Tinkerbells or whole new worlds and Jafars and all that stuff, but that is definitely an option. You can also play a Floodborne oriented option that works with Blue Fairy to draw cards or a more top end heavy control version with like Elsa, Spirit of Winter, Spellbooks and things like that. Now, when you're on the draw with an aggro deck, it's always like, how do I try to claw back advantage? Am I able to just push through for game before I run out of cards? And with the Amethyst package, you know, you should have a lot of card draw available, but you don't necessarily always want to play that card draw because you would rather just develop threats to quest with. In this particular instance, you see me develop a board here and I have to answer my opponent's threats. And when Ruby Amethyst curves out like this, especially on the play, it can be very hard to decide what to do because I can't just let that Cusco stay on board and continue to quest. I have to out it at some point. Um, and so I opt to spend a turn and using my snake to out the Cusco, which does net them a draw one. Now in this particular instance, casting friends on the other side there is representing, you know, yes, obviously a draw two, but it prevents me from questing with that Maleficent or trading that Maleficent into the opponent's Maleficent. And so now I'm at a spot where, yes, I was able to smash the rabbit and get that out of rotation, which is great. They can't bounce it back to hand and draw more cards. But with my snake, do I opt to take out the Maleficent or quest? I'm an aggro deck and I'm like, well, I think I'll quest because at worst if they fox here, which wouldn't be great. And sure enough, of course, I have so many cards in hand. How would they not have a fox? I lose a Maleficent, but at least I can set up the shift Robin Hood for next turn. That's why I played Robin Hood the turn before and out the fox. And that gets me too lore, which keeps me in the race. Um, you know, and I'm the aggro deck and I'm talking about staying in the race, but against Ruby Amethyst on the play. The opponent has a lot of uh, like smaller threats and you're gonna see as this game develops, their deck is very tailored to be anti-aggro. And so if I am able to win this match, it's, it's kind of interesting to see like uh, Steel Amethyst actually have some tools to combat the control decks even into the late game. But the Sumerian Talisman here, I think I'm saying that correctly, I might be wrong though. Um, represents great value for them because if they're playing what you will see the small queen of hearts madam mim fox maui's scars they get tremendous value off of this thing banishing um or their characters getting banished on challenges because like for example in this instance here this queen of hearts is just a draw one now right you out my threat you get a small temple loss and paying two ink but you the queen replaced itself thanks to the talisman and now look at the board state you have two characters on board you have the talisman you have seven ink you have a lot of cards in your hand and I'm still trying to play catch up, constantly trying to play catch up, despite me actually, you know, keeping pace with the lore and outing some of your threats from time to time, like your deck just has too much gas. Um, in a normal Ruby Amethyst matchup, you might have a better time with aggro, um, but in this particular instance, it was very challenging, I found. In a very stabilized board state like this too, you can see here that the Yizma drop actually represents tremendous value for the opponent because they get advantage off of the draw here as well as developing a quest two body after questing with one of their cards that they are, they are now able to put back into their deck and, and obviously draw two off of and so in these particular scenarios yzma is just such an overwhelmingly powerful card but again i've talked about this before is it more of a win more card in this scenario um again you could argue it either way now again I was in probably a wrong mindset here, but I was thinking, let me cycle these foxes to ready up all my characters so that they can't crash Yzma and get a draw off the talisman as well. In hindsight though, like, wouldn't it be better if I forced them to crash the Yzma? Yes, they draw, but I mean, they're drawing tons of cards anyways. And the difference is they don't get the quest for two. So now they're at nine because they quested with that Yzma. Um, and yes, I'll be able to quest for three next turn most likely, but they're going to develop more of a board here they've got eight ink to work with they're going to drop two maleficent and a kuzco most likely and i'm just like yeah you're you're kind of just developing a wide enough board that it's very difficult for me to deal with because what i ended up essentially saying in this situ situation is because of the talisman i'm opting to say i'm going to be the one challenging you instead of you challenging me because you challenging me represents a draw one whereas me challenging you 
is, is also good for the opponent because they still able to request things for two and I had to waste one of my characters to challenge instead of quest. So like the roles were almost reversed as, a, as an aggro player with this card on the field. Um, and again, this is not something you'd likely run into in a, in a set championship. You will run into Ruby Amethyst most likely, but probably not this kind of variation of it. Uh, but it just goes to show you how difficult it is sometimes to make decisions in the moment. Here, I see an opportunity to cast my Grab Your Swords, and I am able to at least keep up with the, the card draw, right, of Ruby Amethyst with the Amethyst Steel deck. But again, I'm supposed to be an aggro player. The game is getting to a state now where we're up, going above 10 ink, and the opponent definitely has a major advantage because the Ruby cards are some of the best cards in the game for top end. Things like Scar, Be Prepared, Lady Tremaine's, um, Madame Medusa's, Maleficent Dragons if they're playing it, etc. And so they have some cards on board here that, you know, when they get banished during their turn, they're going to draw. So I'm going to opt to go a little wide and say, yes, I guess this is the board that's worth be preparing. Unfortunately, I'll lose both my rabbits, um, but I don't want them continually questing with that scar because that's the other problem is that if the scar doesn't end up challenging, well, it just ends up questing anyway. So you can see the tremendous value in this particular matchup this opponent is able to generate with their build because the scar i mean it just outs all of the aggro threats and still readies itself up and if it gets banished it draws with the talisman and then to follow it all up after the be prepared the opponent adds insult to injury and you might be looking at this and thinking well quantum like what are you doing you clearly lost this and i would agree with you uh follow up ursula and the queen's castle they're on 10 lore they're gonna go to 15 next turn because clearly i have no answer for ursula this is one of the cards that people teched into their decks in ruby amethyst in the rise of the floodborne meta specifically because you drop an ursula and steel just has no way to answer it and i'm steel and i'm amethyst and i have no way to answer this ursula um and this opponent you know obviously testing this out here it actually works really well because as you see less Ruby Amethyst in the format, you see less Madame Medusa's, which is the card that naturally counters Ursula. But if you're able to get your Ursula to stick, as in this scenario here, you can see how much value the opponent is able to get. They know I'm not on Ruby, so I, they're not worried about it. Be prepared. And they know, like, <laughs> look how easy it is for me to close out this board now, or this game now with my current board state. Uh, they're going to ink a friend, drop a coup, uh, Rafiki, sorry. And now they just have, like, an overwhelming amount of lore on board and card draw, by the way, uh, because I did do a separate video on this particular board state on how you would potentially go about solving it. And you're going to see what I end up doing in this match. I also link in the description the approach that I think I should have taken that may have been better, but even better than both of those, what I do in this match and what I did in that video, one of my subscribers, L Want, actually posted a very interesting take on how they would approach the situation, which I think is the best yet. And so after you see me go through the motions here on this particular um, turn, I will take a bit of a pause and take a screenshot of that opening scenario of, of this turn and break down what I think or what he said was the play he would make and I think is the best play that you could make in this scenario to out all four characters. The only difference is you don't progress your lore count as much, so maybe it's not like the greatest play, but it does out all the characters on their board and prevent card draw. So let's go ahead and take a look at that scenario very quickly before we return to this match. So I just want to revisit this scenario because I did post a separate video on analyzing the correct lines of play and you saw what I did and if you saw the other video you saw what I said maybe I should have done but somebody named L Want actually pointed out uh, probably the best line yet on how to deal with this and it involves outing every single character on their board. So I just want to go over this quickly to again just show you that it really does um, matter how you sit through and think these these scenarios out and it could obviously be the reason you win or lose a game. So what probably should have happened here is I should have used the Mr. Smee to attack into the Ursula, putting 3 damage on Ursula, 2 damage on Smee, meaning Smee survives. Then I could have hard casted, grab your swords. Okay, so that puts me down to 5 ink here. And that would have dealt with the Rafiki, that would have increased the damage on Ursula to 5, and it would have put 2 damage on the Rabbit and the Queen, not that that's relevant right now. But right now only the Smee is exerted, and I've only used up the Grab Your Swords. Then for 3, I shift the Robin Hood here. So that brings me down to 2 ink available, because it costs 3 to shift. And this Robin Hood, with its 3 strength, is now going to be able to finish off the Ursula, putting me up to 11 lore and taking out the Ursula. From there, I have the Maleficent and the Prince 
no, not exerted, and I have two Strength of the Raging Fire with still three characters on board. Like this Robin Hood will have two damage on it as well from the Ursula, but that's not relevant. Then I just sing the two Strengths of a Raging Fire, dealing four damage total to both the Rabbit and the Queen. This eliminates the entire opponent's board. Um, when I pass back to them, they go to 17. They would have drawn one off Rabbit, and they would have drawn one for turn. Now, as I indicated, or you know, as you've probably seen or will see, they draw Maui for turn, um, and whatever their other mystery card is, you know, I guess it's not really too useful. But if they play the Maui here, right, um, they go down to seven ink available. The Maui probably takes out the Prince, and they have nothing on board to follow up with. They're not going to be drawing cards off Queen challenging. They're not going to be drawing off of Sumerian Talisman uh, banishing one of their characters during a challenge. And so it limits their draws from like what would have been five or six in my other scenarios to just the, um, well, basically just the two, right? One off Rabbit because there's nothing else on Queen's Castle and then one for turn. Um, and sorry, also to point out just the final thing before we wrap up here and go back to the match is with the final two ink, I could have dropped the snake in my hand, bounced back the SME so that it doesn't die during the end, end of the turn since, you know, it's got two damage on it. It's exerted during the end turn. Um, it will take another point of damage and be to the banished pile. So I can bounce this back so I have a readied up snake um, and all my characters still survive. So the Maui comes down, takes out the Prince. You know, they're at 17 lore. They can't really progress their game state anymore unless they have a be prepared to, you know, win the game off the Queen's Castle after clearing out my board. I can likely try to follow up next turn and push for game because they'll have basically two turns if they don't put something else along board with the Maui in order to try to quest for game. So as you can see, I did not end up doing that. The opponent still ends up drawing two for turn uh, because they drew one off Rabbit and one for turn, obviously. And they're going to drop the Maui and challenge the Prince. The issue is now, because I didn't out the Queen, they're going to be able to draw off of this Queen. And if they really wanted to out my board even more, they could use their Queen to challenge one of my other characters and draw two because the Queen would be banished and it challenged, so it draws one off Queen itself, one off the Talisman. Thankfully, the opponent opts to quest here because they probably think, you're at 12 lore, I'm at 17, I just quest, my Queen's Castle wins me the game next turn, and I just put another set of characters on board and just win the game. Um, but I did my math wrong, and I thought I had game because of the goat bounce if they didn't challenge with the queen. But I didn't realize that I needed an additional goat bounce. But thankfully, we draw one for turn, and we're able to clutch this one out. But this was uh, some very bad plays on my end, potentially. And yeah, just things you need to keep into consideration if you're playing aggro. It's not as simple as you might think it is. So let me know in the comment section below if you think I made that matchup harder on myself than I needed to because Ruby Amethyst should normally be a decent matchup for you as an aggro player. But again, didn't expect Queen of Hearts and stuff to be taking out my uh, my aggro threats the way that they were and, and generating the advantage off of the talisman there. But uh, thankfully we got a little bit lucky at the end to clutch that one out. In this particular matchup uh, against Emerald Steel, there are a lot of different variations of this deck as well that you could probably face. The discard version seems to be the most popular, the one with the Friar Tux and whatnot. Um, but the traditional one utilizing the um, higher end shift targets uh, with the Bucky, not necessarily Bucky discard, but Bucky's the only discard engine that it really plays and it plays a lot of Floodborns with the morph in order to capitalize off of cheap and very fast shifts. Regardless though, um, I, with aggro, you you obviously, like I said, will, will struggle a little bit with steel, but in certain scenarios, you can definitely come out on top. Here, you can see me deciding if I do want to end up developing a snake or just let my Maleficent ready back up to quest again. I opt to bring back the Maleficent and the opponent redrops their morph that I bounced back with the uh, Befuddle here. So the Befuddle acts as a tempo disruptor, similar to how it functioned in the Amethyst emerald deck when it was when i was testing it out and um yeah we're able to smash the morph so just keep them off of developing anything on board mainly stopping the shift tinkerbell because we know how threatening tinkerbell can be against aggro it would instantly out my maleficent um but they opt to cast a baboom on it which is you know decent for me because again it costs them two ink uh and they don't develop anything on board just to slow me down in terms of the questing power so we're going to drop a Maleficent here, a little bit of a slower play, but you know the opponent does have six cards in hand and we have two. Um, so we're going to really bank on this friends on the other side to help us refill our hand. The opponent unfortunately drops a Beast Tragic Hero. They have four cards left in hand and I just have to wonder you know, what threats might they end up playing. Do I really want them drawing a bunch of different cards? Uh, is it worth developing a Rabbit here or do I think they're going to sing a whole new world at some point? So I just hard cast 
uh, grab your swords to prevent the draw, which in hindsight is probably not the greatest. Just let them get the two, the, the, uh, the draw two. But then I risk them drawing into more of uh, the steel removal, like a grab your swords, which would devastate my board. The opponent reveals that they're on most likely the Beast Relentless OTK combo, um, which is wild. You haven't seen this deck in a, in a minute, but because they're focused on pinging damage that again is a really good counter to aggro so this is another really tough matchup for me thankfully within the first couple of turns i was able to get up to seven lore um, but again not where you would want to be by turn seven i'm going to be able to slow the game down a little bit though and take up my opponent's board to a certain degree and i you know knowing what the opponent is on i have to be very wary of the bayou and the beast relentless coming down i don't play any real high end top end removal but the OTK combo might be a little bit harder to pull off against an aggro deck since as they ping damage on my characters, they get taken out a lot quicker and a lot easier than they normally would have. These sheriffs though are a bit of a problem, um, but I did think uh, I saw the opponent discard two off of their first whole new world and I'm like, is the, are these the final two sheriffs they have? Uh, because if so, I might be in a decent position to just like not even have to worry about this combo. And I'm already far enough ahead that if I can develop enough of a board, um, I'm really putting them on, you need multiple grab your swords in order to out my threat. So here you see me drop the Maleficent, use the Fox to bounce it back. And I think I opt to take out the Sheriff here because the character is probably more of a threat, the double the double ping damage rather than just the, um, the Sheriff itself. We're able to bounce back the uh, Fox after we took something out. And we still drop the Maleficent, which again, you can argue is a bit of a mistake because it's going to get outed by the... Um, Sheriff moving to the bayou and then questing, drawing, discarding, dealing one damage. But they have Tinkerbell anyway, so it doesn't really matter. And again, I'm looking like the 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 board is getting to a state where I just can't manage it, right? Like the opponent, the opponent's Tinkerbell really shuts down aggro because whatever I develop, the Tinkerbell is just going to take out something, deal two damage to something else. They have even more removal in the um, along came Zeus, uh, and I'm just like, yeah, I'm I'm, a, I'm in a little bit of trouble here. So we're going to opt to, again, slow things down a little bit, get a little bit of a loop going with the goat, and then with the fox, a are able to take out the sheriff. And now if the opponent opts to throw their Tinkerbell into the fox, it's going to take four damage. And unfortunately, they have this card, which is like wild. They don't really see this at all. But the Robin Hood comes in super clutch for them, the bow, and taking out my, my fox there. And I'm just like, okay, sure. That's really good value for you. Um, they're gonna quest with the Tinkerbell and then move it to the Bayou after. So clearly they have something in hand that they don't wanna discard or risk drawing into something that they want to discard either. So we're just gonna drop the um, Prince and the Robin Hood and pass the opponent. Yeah, I guess that's what it was. It was a whole new world. So they're just going to sing the whole new world and they have nine ink to work with now. Um, the board state isn't necessarily the worst for us because this Robin Hood is decent value. Um, and like I said, the Beast Relentless comes down they don't really have any more sheriffs, but do they really need it? Because they have enough pinging damage on board probably in order to quest with the beast three or four times. Um, and with the pressure they're putting on, it's likely too much for me to handle and I will likely just lose the game. Um, so again, in this board state, I do have some removal options with the strength of the Raging Fire and the Smash. So I have to really consider what the best line of play is. Um, and I think I was, I ended up, you know, not being able to calculate things out correctly or like go through all the scenarios and I, the timer ends up coming up and I think I make a suboptimal play here. Um, it's hard, I guess it's a little bit easier in person when you are physically with the cards to like think through your lines, I think, because when I, when I'm on pixel born, you know, it's hard, like, I don't know, it's just something about the digital like version. You just have trouble trying to visualize everything working out the way that you want it to. Um, so here, I think I do make a bit of a misplay. You can see me thinking for a very long time, but I eventually I'm going to have to make a decision. So I just, I'm just like, well, let me see what I draw into because I wanted to draw into something that I could play on board to make my strength more, uh, usable. And we do, we draw into a Robin Hood, uh, double Robin Hoods even. And I'm like, okay, do I just go super wide here? Even though it plays into a grab your swords, because with this setup, I'm going to be able to strength away most likely their Tinkerbell. Oh no, I'm gonna throw something into their Tinkerbell. Am I? Because then I can smash the Tinkerbell. Yeah, I don't even remember what I end up doing here. And then I can Strength the Beast, but I have to, I can hard cast, no, I can't, I have to sing Strength. And I think this is where I got caught up. I was like, I have to sing the Strength, which means I can't throw the Robin Hood into something. So I'm kind of screwed. Um, so because I know like the Tinkerbell 
Yeah, is yeah. I mean, maybe I shouldn't have attacked with the fox there. Yeah, I definitely shouldn't have because the Tinkerbell can't take out the Robin Hood. No, they, they could. Yeah, so I'm stuck either way because they could tap their small Robin Hood, deal one damage to my Robin Hood, then use the bow of Robin Hood to deal one more damage to my Robin Hood, and then use Tinkerbell to take out my Robin Hood and then deal two damage to anything else anyway. So it didn't matter. I was screwed anyways. They have another Tinkerbell, which is their fourth Tinkerbell, and they did indeed have another Sheriff. So this is their fourth one for sure. Um, and now their Robin Hood bow item is online. They can ping damage with their small Robin Hood. They can take out a threat with their big Tinkerbell to take out another one of my ready threats if they want. And I'm just in a world of hurt here, right? Um, so yeah, they take out the Fox there and they still have their small Robin Hood that they can use to take out anything that I have on board here. Um, and I'm facing down two big Tinks and a Sheriff with, uh, yeah, these Robin Hoods. And I'm like, what am I really gonna do? I do have a big Robin Hood in hand, which I'm gonna be able to shift onto the smaller Robin Hood. And that is gonna get me some value, uh, most likely challenging their small Robin Hood. Yeah, and then uh, I'm gonna be able to gain two lore, so I'm gonna be able to go to 11, and then I can throw my Maleficent into their exerted Tinkerbell to take that out, um, which leaves them with just the Sheriff and the, big, the other big Tinkerbell on board. Um, unfortunately, I can't out that big Tinkerbell. The Smash isn't going to do enough either since the Sheriff is a 2-4 body and the Tinkerbell is a 4-5 body. But I'm going to drop the Hercules to force the opponent to throw the um, Tinkerbell into the Hercules so that they can't take out the Robin Hood. They have yet another... This is their fourth Tinkerbell for sure then. I think I said it was their fourth one last time. But I'm just like, man, this is brutal. Facing down all four Tinkerbells, all the pinging damage I, with my aggro deck. <clears throat> it's like, what are these terrible matchups, right? Um... Like, people teching their decks against aggro, and I'm just, you know, you're running aggro. I guess you can't complain, you know. Uh, you make the choice. You run the risk of people teching against you. Um, so they end up wiping out my whole board because I definitely did not expect that last Tinkerbell being dropped there. But I don't really know what else, you know, I can consider because, yeah, the opponent would likely have, like, a Grab Your Swords or some other removal song anyways. The Tinkerbell is probably the best option for them, though, because it is also a body on board. And now I'm facing down a Hans, which is going to quest and get them lore, a Tinkerbell, Tinkerbell, and um, again, this Robin Hood item, which is a bit of a nuisance as well whenever my characters are get damaged, and the Sheriff here. And I just can't have enough to finish these characters off. They have three damage on the Tinkerbell and the Sheriff, but I'm trying to think here, like, what's the best option? With 10 ink, though, I do, I, I can go wide. I have a lot of cards in my hand. The opponent does only have one. Unlikely that it's another whole new world. So I think, like, for sure I have to smash the um, Hans, and my game plan here is, like, well, they quest with everything, I just go wide. I leave everything readied up and I just quest the best I can in order to progress my game state. Um, I trade my fox into something that I know it'll get KO'd with, I think. No? Okay, I'm gonna, okay. I develop a goat, I take out the sheriff so that if their Tinkerbell takes out my fox, they can only deal two damage to the goat and the goat doesn't get outed, then my goat can take out something um, next turn. But they don't do that. They're going to opt to... Yeah, they just have all the answers. They're just going to Zeus my goat anyways and clear my board and then just quest with the Tinkerbell. It actually didn't make sense because, yeah, they could have still outed the goat anyways if they took out the fox with the Tinkerbell, deal two damage to go, and then Robin Hood bow the goat away. So, yeah, that, that line doesn't make sense either. Um, we, drew, we draw a goat per turn, and I'm just like, actually, you know what? I just go super wide here, and I just quest for game next turn because... I drop both these Maleficents. Oh, I can't drop both the Maleficents. That sucks. Um, one away. But this represents enough. One with the rabbit, one with the goat. I just gained one with goat. So that's two go to 16. And Smee go to 17, 18. Um, yeah, it's still just not enough. So what ends up happening here? The Robin Hood pings down the Smee. The bow will ping down the Smee again. And then they just quest and pass oh, okay i think i know here okay uh yeah this one was interesting i crash rabbit to draw and i have to put the opponent on you're only going to be able to quest for um like five at most so the sme is going to trade with the robin hood because i want to get it off the board that's interesting and then qu crash into the Tinkerbell to gain lore, go to 15. The opponent is only going to be able to go up to 18. And now that I've outed the Robin Hood, I'm able to go wide on the board knowing that the opponent can't take out any of my threats unless they top deck a song to remove one of my threats. Uh, they don't. And therefore, I'm just going to be able to quest for game next turn. Um, 
yeah, that was an interesting one there to try to solve it at the end. Uh, but again, just goes to show you how hard it is, even on the play against Steel, especially decks that like ping damage with an aggro deck. But you can win, uh, but it is definitely a huge challenge. Anyways, guys, that's going to wrap up this video. Let me know what you think if you enjoyed, uh, and the deck profile will be coming shortly after this.